Hi everyone, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna thank you for coming to the first of two out of the lab. This is sort of like an inside the actor's studio for a prominent social psychologist. And I'm very, very excited to introduce Dr. Sarah Gaither from Duke and Dr. Keith Maddox from Tufts for an interview today. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's a real honor. It's never, I'm, we're on a big stage. It's pretty cool. It's right? pretty cool. Pretty yeah. cool. Um, so I'm supposed to do a formal introduction um, for those of you who don't know him as well as I do. So Dr. Maddox is a very, very proud University of Michigan undergrad alum. Go Congrats blue. on your, your recent national title. It's all because of you, clearly. Um, he left that more football-oriented school and went to a sandy beach school to get his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, that was back in what year, Keith? Oh, wow. I want to say like 1992 when I first got there. Yeah, yeah when you graduated in 1998. So oh, good. I graduated. Yeah, yeah, at least according to what I Googled. I'm already feeling there. this test. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Um, you were then immediately hired because he's so amazing by Tufts University to be faculty. There's a lot of Tufts people in the crowd today. Um, and he's been there ever since. And that's where I was lucky enough to meet him as a graduate student. And what you might not know, because I don't think I've ever told you this, is my entire career until I got to Tufts, I only had white men as mentors. And so you were actually one of the first mentors of color I ever had. And your biracial kids made me feel completely validated, oh. right? And so you being my mentor circle, I think I dedicate a lot of my career to having you as a part of that first experience and a big reason why now I choose to try and give back to other scholars of color. So that's fantastic. Thank, thank you, thank you for, appreciate that. for starting that with me. Um, but anyway, back to more about you. Um, so your research has been funded through SPISI, the Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service at Tufts University, the National Science Foundation. You present all over the place, academic departments, professional meetings, student organizations. You are an expert witness in lots of civil litigation trials. Um, you also go on lots of DEI type talks, which we'll talk about later. Um, you've also chaired the SPSP Diversity and Climate Committee, the Arts and Sciences Engineering Equal Education and Opportunity Committee at Tufts University, and you're also an elected fellow for SPISI, SPSP, and CESP, which is a lot of things. It's a lot of things. A lot of things. Not yeah. all happening at the same time, though, sometimes, so. No, but it's a lot of things. Yeah. Um, you're perhaps best known in your research, and most of you in this room know this, um, for your research on phenotypicality bias, right? And so uh, Dr. Maddox was one of the first people to really put data behind the fact that we treat minorities differently based on colorism, issues of skin color, phenotypicality issues, the features that we have. So. I think it's really because of his work in line with a few others in our field that has really pushed us to be considering the fact that we shouldn't be treating racial and ethnic minority groups as a monolith, right? So his work has really, I think, spearheaded the way for so many scholars of color, diversity scholars in our field. I mean, we all cite your Maddox and Gray paper, I think, in every single paper that's looking at this. So for that, thank you for paving the way for <laughs> so you. many of us. Um, but perhaps one thing that most people would highlight about you is really your incredible thoughtfulness, your dedication to mentoring others, working with students, undergrads, grad students. Um, and one quote from one of your colleagues at Tufts to um, share this was from Dr. Jessica Remedios. She wrote, Keith is one of the most open-minded, thoughtful, and reflective scholars I know. I'm regularly amazed by his capacity and stamina to appreciate other people's perspectives, whether to research or just in life. He's just driven by a desire to understand like a true scientific curiosity. Anyone who's ever had a debate with him knows this. He'll just keep asking you questions or reframing your points constantly until he really gets it. Um, I think that's what's wonderful about she you. Did it. So Thank she's you. right there. For those I know, members. that's great. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to Keith before I interrogate him. Further. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Zero. That was a great intro. No, no I try. Um, so before we get to Keith's research background, um, in the honor of our social psychology conference we're all at today, I thought I would adopt a couple questions from the Fast Friends protocol, so all of you can actually get to know other things about Keith besides just his research and mentoring careers. So okay. and he didn't actually tell me his answers to these, so I'm actually excited to know what he's going to say. So, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to see. Given the choice of anyone in the world, whom would you want to have over as a dinner guest? I, going back and forth, right, everybody in this room. Uh, no, going back and forth on this, I, I'm going to pick, uh, there's uh, an astrophysicist named Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's who I'd pick. Okay, why, why him? Uh, I think there are a couple of different things. One is uh, he's got a really great way of communicating, you know, just like science communicating, sort of talking about science and communicating to other people, um, particularly the wonders of the universe. Um, astronomy was my first love, and so anytime I get an opportunity to see somebody talk about astronomy, that's something I'm going to 
take into account. Um, but the other thing is that uh, he also, I don't know, there's something about sort of the way in which he talks and interacts with people who brings the best out in them. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more about how he does that. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. Let me know when you have him over. Right. Him over. Um, so, okay, next question. If you could wake up tomorrow with any superpower, what would your superpower be? Yeah, I want to call it um, a mashup, but I'm not going to do that. That's cheating. Yes, it is I cheating. I said one. Yes, you did pick okay. one. I'm going to pick uh, teleportation. Ah, yeah, with luggage. With luggage. Yes. Yeah. With luggage. And how much luggage? Uh, well, I don't know, three, four bags. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. He's got room for all of you, everyone. <laughs> um, all right. And finally, how do you like your coffee? Uh, cream and sugar. Mm. Always that, cream and sugar. Is that contentious? Uh, it can be. Sometimes people think that means I don't like coffee, which I can understand <laughs> that. But I also think that it means, you know, somebody who drinks mixed drinks doesn't like the alcohol that they're drinking. And so the coffee is basically like a mixed drink to me. All right, there you have it. So if you want to get Keith coffee later at this conference, you all know Cream what sugar. he likes. All right, so we're going to get more focused on scientists, Dr. Maddox now. Um, so thinking back to when you were growing up, what were some of the experiences you had that motivated you to want to be a social psychologist? Uh, that's funny. So like thinking back with kind of retrospect, mm -hmm. the, um, the thing that, that most sort of drove me into this and I think was uh, consistent with sort of some of the experiences that I had growing up and also in college was just the fact that I was basically I was a black man but I was growing up in a community that was mostly white and in particular I'm also a black man that looks a certain way in terms of my typicality I'm kind of very phenotypically black but I also have other mannerisms that people might consider white so I think I grew up in a place of somewhat sort of ambiguity just like not quite knowing who I was in terms of identity development and the way I think about it now is that I was kind of bicultural if you will if you sort of think about it that in one way my physical appearance had um, implications for how people would think about me and some of the assumptions they would make but if they listen to me speak or they watch some of my behavioral mannerisms kinds of things that I like to do then it might make them think a little bit differently so I feel like I went through that experience that um, a lot of you know multiracial people or also bicultural people go through where people are trying to figure you out and can't quite place you because you don't fit quite into the categories and the boundaries and that's not something I really thought explicitly about or had a good way of thinking about until I ran into social psychology. So um, in college, when I took a psychology class, actually I started out thinking about astronomy and so I went that route, but um, astronomy and I broke up because I realized there was too much physics involved and so that was just that's too much for me at the time. Tyson comes back now. That's I right, see. yeah. There's still a love for the physics and the astronomy, but I just remember that I loved astronomy because I really enjoyed like looking at the stars and looking at the planets and hearing about some of those facts. But then when I realized that if you wanted to be an astronomer, you were really looking at, you know, electromagnetic spectra, right? So you were sort of learning a lot about sort of things that were outside of the visual field. And those things weren't quite as exciting to me. So, um, yeah, it was just like a very superficial relationship. So we broke up. But, um, yeah, but social psychology was great because it gave me a way or a framework of starting to think a little bit about how people might think about me and particularly like social cognition, right? This idea that we have these mental representations of people in our minds, that those mental representations are filters through which we look at and interpret their behavior and the extent to which people might look at me and expect certain kinds of things, but then be confused when they don't see or hear those things and that they're working it out. And I think that that was the first time that I'd actually had some intellectual or some um, research sort of framework to kind of think about what my own experience was like. So in a lot of ways, like, yeah, the reason I'm here because research is me search. Oh, you all heard that right first. Research is me. Research. Research. It's, well, all we research heard this in the research. plenary earlier today, right? That there is this pushback against people who want to do me search, right? Yeah. And so, again, a trailblazer and helping those of us want to do that, right? Because you did it before all, all of us. Yeah. Um, so, knowing you wanted to be this me searcher, what finally pushed you to decide to be a poor, underpaid grad student for five to six years of your life? Uh, well, I was doing it in Santa Barbara, which True. made a big difference. Dolphins help. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's okay to be poor and underpaid in Santa Barbara. There are a lot of things that offset that. But no, really, it was, uh, I didn't have a really good idea of like what career paths there were um, when I was an undergraduate. So I had taken a social psychology class. Um, and actually, the thing that really got me into social cognition is the sense that I actually kind of discovered it on my own, which was completely illusory, but it was meaningful for me at the time. So I was uh, taking a class that um, was that I signed up for called Attitudes and Behavior, and it was taught by James Hilton. And at the same time, I was taking another class on cognitive psychology, and that was taught by John Janitis. This is at University of Michigan. And as we were sort of taking those classes, we had a textbook for the social, um, sorry, for the attitudes and behavior class. And the textbook was called Social Cognition. 
Um, but I don't somehow remember that, right? So I just remember the fact that the things that I was reading in that really reminded me of the things that I was reading in my cognitive psychology textbook. And I thought, this is really great. Like some of the ideas and principles that are going on here really are applicable to the context where you're thinking about people. And again, even though the title of the book was Social Cognition, I felt like I put those things together myself. And so I had this sort of sense of discovery, right, that really just helped me fall in love with social psychology and social cog. So, yeah. And then in terms of going to graduate school, I think at first I was pretty naive. I just thought graduate school was more school um, at the time. I hadn't spent a lot of time trying to develop any research experiences within college. Um, I didn't work in anybody's lab. After college, I graduated and I spent some time trying to figure out like what grad school would look like. So I think I spent some time. I did help um, a couple of people with some coding of dissertation data. So I did like I work a little bit as an RA with a couple of graduate students then. I took a class from a lecturer named Sherry Hatcher, which was basically about getting into graduate school. I spent some time cultivating some relationships with it, like um, advisors or I should say professors that I had had when I was in college. And uh, there were some people who provided me with letters of recommendation. And then I think the thing that, that helped me to sort of think more about like what my trajectory would be was I um, actually was able to, at uh, Michigan they had the, um, the Institute for Social Research and Claude Steele was somebody who had just left Michigan um, but came back to give a talk and in his talk he talked about um, essentially the the dilemma of black males in society and the dilemma that he was pointing out at that time was just the idea that we didn't have role models right that a lot of the role models that we had were specified in certain type domains so athletics music entertainment things like that and there weren't role models in other domains or at least role models that were publicized um, and talked about that people could see and ultimately envisioned as being a path that they would be able to take themselves and I remember just resonating with that because, you know, kind of like you would mention me, Claude Steele was the first black professor that I had when I was in college and I didn't actually have him. It was after college in a talk. So it was this idea that then I might see myself as being a kind of person that could be that kind of role model to another person. And that's honestly what I wrote about in my, um, my personal statement to getting a grad school and it seemed to have worked. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, it's a lot. So once you've got... It's always going to be a lot. It's always a lot. <laughs> Life is a lot, everyone. Life is a lot. Um, so what type of graduate training did you receive then? So you, you joined this program, you wanted to sort of see yourself in research. So how would you sort of describe the training you received and how did that match your expectations? So I think a lot of early career scholars sort of sign up for this grad school thing, thinking one thing, but then they experience something else. So what was your experience? Yeah, so I, uh, like I said, I didn't know a lot of what to expect when I went to graduate school. I thought it was a lot more school. I didn't realize how much research was a component of it. And I learned that pretty quickly. And I do say this about myself. I feel like I was always like a couple of years behind. So even now in life, I'm a couple of years behind where I need to be in order to do the things I'm doing now. But in some ways, that two years behind was kind of a good thing. It just gave me a little bit more time and perspective. And I had a lot of patience from people in graduate school that you know, weren't necessarily sort of pressing for me to publish. And again, trying to get things done that we needed to get done, but not necessarily with the same level of pressure that I think a lot of people experienced and even experience more now. So that time was really um, very informative for me. I think the, the sense of not knowing exactly what you wanted to do, being in school, taking classes, but then ultimately coming to it. Again, like I said, it came around eventually, but I don't think I really, I don't think the training that I got was really consistent with what I expected. So like I said, I didn't expect there to be a lot more research, but when I decided to go to grad school, I was thinking that I wanted to learn about social psychology in order to be able to do something with it, right? To affect some kind of change in the world. And I was disillusioned because the nature of the training was interesting and cool because I do like experimentation, but that was so focused on lab space research. It was so focused on developing theory that again, I've grown an appreciation for over time. But at the time, I think I was a little disillusioned because we weren't learning how to do anything to affect or use this knowledge to affect change in the real world. So that was uh, a little bit of a challenging time for me, but ultimately I think I did come to value the benefit and the potential benefit of honing your skill in the lab. But then there's also got to be that step where you do sort of take it and try to apply it in other contexts. And we weren't getting that training at the time. And there wasn't a lot of support for people who wanted to do things like that then too. So with that, with that conflict you were sort of experiencing, why did you decide to be faculty? Why not try and get a job in industry? And you know, a little bird told me you, you don't really love the phrase leaving academia. A little so, bird. A little bird, <laughs> little bird named Keith. Um, I can, do. can you tell me more about your, your views of why faculty, yeah. leaving academia, staying in academia? I think, yeah. The Okay, so why I chose to be a faculty is because I didn't actually think or see of any other path. So I do remember feeling a little like, 
you know when you get disillusioned in grad school and it happens to a lot of people where you're thinking well maybe shouldn't should i be doing this should i not be doing this and i think the problem is i didn't know what else to do so i kind of stuck it out a little longer than maybe i could have if i'd known that there were other options so i will say that i'm a you know survivor of this process but i'm a very lucky and fortunate survivor i'm not sure that's the right choice for everybody but um because of that, I did stick around. I didn't really know what else I might be, you know, kind of like eligible or able to do. And I don't think there was a lot of incentive or opportunity at the time. So it was um, a little stigmatizing if you told people that you didn't want to be a researcher, right? And particularly stigmatizing if you didn't want to be a researcher at a, a school where you're going to also be doing teaching and doing research, right? So if you mentioned that you wanted to, let's say, focus a little bit more on teaching and away from research, then you know, you got a little bit of a cold shoulder um, from other faculty in the program. Uh, and again, I think I sort of understand it, and I'm going to get to the leaving academia part in a second, but it's because in some ways, the work that we do as graduate students, it looks like training to be a professor. Um, it's really training to be a researcher. Um, and it's just the idea that you're doing professor type work because that's the stuff that we need done. And that's how we provide support to individuals who are in graduate school so that they do have a little bit of time and freedom and opportunity to focus more on honing that skill in terms of working in the lab or whatever research setting you might have. And so it's this idea that when we do try to train people and it does look a lot like being a professor, but we're trying to train people to do things more generally. And I kind of align it to like an internship. You're sort of doing an internship for a professor. And so the work that you're going to do during that internship is going to look a lot like being a professor, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the skills have to be used to become a professor at some point in time. So that's where I, I kind of don't like the term leaving academia, but I do also understand it because um, what I just described is great and it's a viewpoint and a perspective and an attitude, but it's not shared by everyone. So there are a lot of people that are training you that do decide that if you're not going to do exactly what I do or how I do it, um, you know, there's a legacy that I'm hoping to leave in the field, perhaps there might be a lot of other motivations or reasons. But if you're not doing that, then, you know, then I don't see a lot of value in you. And I think that's unfortunate, and, but I do think it's also changing over time. So I think that there's a lot more acceptance for people who might want to take different kinds of career paths. And I think there's also greater incentive structures for not just those individuals, but for the instructors that have to think about how they're going to devote their time and the extent to which graduate students are helping us to get tenure and get promoted. We have incentive structures that we're responding to as well. So if those things are relaxed and take into account a little bit more of those other kinds of opportunities where people want to move into different kinds of careers and paths, then we're going to be able to create that space for students. There's also not enough faculty jobs for everyone. Well, that's true too. I yeah. mean, there's a bigger part of this issue, right, which yeah. I think is what a lot of us are struggling with, right? When you get these skills within these academic ivory towers, as we call them, right, which skills do you think help transfer into other contexts? So can you tell us a little more about what skills you think grad students maybe should focus on and if they are sort of confused about where they want to go? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I'm still a little old school in terms of thinking that the, the traditional training that we get in terms of trying to do research and how to do research and publishing research and, um, you know, trying to publish, I should say, but using those skills to communicate and get feedback on that and to respond to that feedback and then to try to get it out there. Those are all skills that I think people are going to need in other contexts, no matter what. So I still think that the, the process of getting engaged in academic psychology is a good skill and a good it develops it helps you to develop the skills that you're going to need as a researcher but i will say that i don't have a lot of experience outside of that um, to be able to say that with as much confidence as i would like but we have heard from alumni and you know from other people who are in industry that those skills are useful but they also need other types of skills as well because they are in a different kind of environment so i think the the important part is like to think about students being able to develop and hone that craft of being a researcher, but to also give them some space to figure out some of the other skills they might need in terms of teamwork or management or what have you that um, would help them to be a little bit more successful in the industry. So you, you mentioned Claude Steele earlier. I don't know if he's the answer to this next question, but can you tell everyone a little about who your research inspirations are? Yeah. People who sort of motivate you to still do the work you want to do, mentor the students you want to work with? I, yeah, Claude is one that comes to mind, um, and that was somebody who, like I said, I met him, I didn't actually meet him during that day, so that day when I was an undergraduate, but he was one of the people that just helped me kind of figure out the direction that I really wanted. Um, but that wasn't as much about research, it was a little bit more like an identity thing, so it was sort of like the kind of person I wanted to be. Um, but then later on, when he started to do research in um, stereotype threat, I remember I was a graduate student, and he was giving a talk at UCLA, and uh, we had developed, the UCSB graduate students had developed a relationship with the UCLA students. So this was um, just, a, we would set up opportunities to have conferences. So we'd have some conference, one year would be at UCSB, another year would be at Santa Barbara, or sorry, at UCLA. 
And um, in that context, through that communication, we found out that Claude Steele was giving a talk at UCLA. So a bunch of us went down to see that talk. And it was the first talk on stereotype threat before any of the papers were published. And I just remember, you know, at that time, it was funny because, again, I focus on social cognition in terms of the work that I do. And then this work involved some cognition, right? So it talks a little bit about some of the mental sort of um, accessibility of the kinds of ideas when you might experience this sense of threat. But it really is more motivational, right? It's about the experience of that threat and the consequences of it. But I just thought that that was great because it did a lot to marry um, the sort of the cognitive and motivational sort of perspectives for me <laughs> that I think really reflects the kind of integration that, you know, I think we all kind of aspire to in psychology to see that all these different fields and subfields that we're working on, we do a lot of specialization, but the goal is ultimately to bring everything back together and to come up with more integrated perspectives on trying to understand and then ultimately predict and change human behavior. So if you, um, if there's somebody who's able to, to do that, to talk about cognition, to talk about motivation and other factors that might have an influence, those are the kinds of things that I get really excited about. Um, and I also like uh, Jennifer um, Richardson is another person who's a big inspiration, not just me, but for everybody else. And again, it was that same idea of like trying to take this, this process as real process. It was a lot more um, closer to the kinds of things that I wish I would have been studying, but then to integrate the sort of the cognitive components of, let's say, having an interracial interaction and sort of the ways in which anxiety might influence some of your cognitive processing in those contexts. And that idea of like bringing those things together and talking about how those things interact to influence these real world consequences is something that that's a, I still aspire to, to be perfectly honest. I'm not quite sure I'm there, but it's, a, it's the kind of thing that really is inspirational. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the two researchers you bring up, right, are really focusing on lots of challenges that especially people of color face within academic circles, right? Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little more about what challenges you feel like you faced across your career, whether it was based on your own identities or certain obstacles you had in your paths and kind of what advice you'd have for trainees on how to overcome those things, how to cope with them? Yeah, um, I guess the thing, the, the thing that comes to mind most is um, just the idea that, that sometimes uh, the kind of incentives that faculty have are not necessarily aligned with the desires and needs and wants of graduate students and that that misalignment of sort of like what we all want can lead to a lot of conflict and friction and it took me a while to realize that um, and then even after I realized it trying to figure out how to fix it I'm still doing it right so I still have challenges and struggles in terms of trying to make sure that those things come into more alignment but the general idea is that, you know, if we live in publish and par publish or perish, and that's sort of the incentive structure that we work under, then in some ways, the graduate students who are helping us to make those progress, to make that kind of progress so that we can keep our job and make promotions and, or, you know, get promoted in our jobs, those are the people that we're going to want to create incentives for and to kind of, you know, help to support. And the students who aren't necessarily doing that, then we're going to be motivated to not necessarily allow that to happen. But I think what I started to experience a little bit later in my career is that there has been a little bit more relaxation to appreciation of a lot of other contributions that people can make as a faculty member. Um, so, you know, again, publishing is great, but the numbers of publications may be dying out compared to the quality of publications. Also thinking about some of the ways in which you can contribute with respect to service and the extent to which you can sort of contribute to your university environment. And for me, it's lucky because, um, again, that's in the context of DEI, which, again, has ebbed and flowed in terms of its um, importance to people and organizations, but is definitely flowing these days, um, but with a lot of opposition, which I think is maybe a good sign. Um, so that idea is that you, you want to make sure that graduate students kind of are aligned with what you want to do and that what you want to do is aligned with what they want to do. And so I think it's really important at the very beginning just to make sure that you're on the same page. But I think it's also challenging and hard to convey what that page looks like to somebody who's just coming into graduate school because you're going to come in and it's great. You can say all these things, but then the experience of it can be very, very different. And that's where it's challenging. So I think the, the places where I made the most progress and I think I've had the most success in mentoring, ironically, are the things where I like had to let go of that incentive structure and start to maybe not do as much in terms of publishing and research productivity and encourage the opportunities for my students to go out and find other kinds of experiences, internships or what have you, and spend their time doing things that weren't necessarily in the service of my career. So I got lucky because I was able to do that and it, it seems to have worked out, but I don't know if that's necessarily what everybody is working under. And I feel like if, you can't figure out a way to make those things come into greater alignment at the very beginning with your students, then that's going to be a more of a failing strategy for most people compared to others. I mean, I think when I was a grad student, my meetings with you are always much longer than my meetings with Sam, um, but in a good way, right? It's like that extra time and effort that I think faculty should be putting in to work with their students, especially when they are 
having challenges, right? Things outside of academia, right? And so I think you've always shown this nice balance of yeah. trying to see the whole student or the whole person, right, um, all the time. Um, I think. I, well, again, pushing back on my call for my colleague here, I think there is a lot that he also provides in that context. But for me, it was like, so tell me the story because I got a story for you. Right. So I feel like I was a little bit more chatty mostly, but I think more. you guys probably more. got some things done. Right. A little more. Yeah. A little more. Yeah. A little more. Yeah, yeah. Now we all have different approaches. Right. That's the diversity of science. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so speaking of, I guess, this connection of your research as everyone is cackling at you in the front row here. Um, <laughs> You are now the editor of Social Cognition, um, so congratulations on this new service Thank you have you. agreed to do. Um, so now that you're editor, what are your goals for trying to, what kind of research are you looking for in that journal? Um, you've talked with me before about this big schism you sort of see within diversity science practices more broadly as it relates to social cognition research. So, yeah. so what is, what's your vision? I think, so like I said, social, this is all, it's amazing that I'm here. Um, in this position, sitting here on the stage, but also just the opportunities that I have in the field. And social cognition, I think I mentioned, is it's not my first love, it's probably my second love, maybe my third, but the general idea is that because I discovered it myself, if you remember that part, um, I have a special sort of sense of ownership of it. And I think the thing that I discovered that I loved about it the most is that it's, it's got a lot of potential for explaining how people go about making decisions. And again, because you can have that explanatory power, then you can make some predictions about what's going to happen. And you can also define uh, design interventions that are going to affect change. So to the extent to which I think it has that potential and that power, what I'd like to do is to, to do a lot more to sort of see if we can help it to realize that potential. And this is a little of an egocentric view. I'm sure it's being realized out there. Um, it's happening. But it's not necessarily coming through the pages of our journal. Um, I feel like the schism that I talked about that you're talking about is this similar schism, like the focus on laboratory, sort of theoretically focused um, and developing theory at the expense of more applied work. And I think that's a big mistake. Um, I think it is important to be able to hone that skill and to be able to develop theory because theory, as Lewin said, nothing so practical is a good theory. But the only way to develop theory is to put it into practice and see where it works and where it breaks down. It gives you opportunity to find potential factors and moderators that are going to help you to elaborate and to develop your theory. So um, to the extent to which there are people who don't value application, maybe they don't do it themselves, but they might not even value when other people do it, that's a mistake because you're missing an opportunity to get information to help to develop your theory. Um, there's also people who don't value the theory development because, again, they think social cognition and the focus on processes and mechanisms is so... Um, trivial, I think is a word that would come to mind. Um, and it doesn't get to the meaningful context, but that kind of control comes at some expense, but that control could be potentially utilized in the context that you really want to affect change. So what I think I really want to do is to try to take those, what I think of as two different camps of people and try to bring them closer together in ways, either through collaborative work or to get people to start to think about the, what the other person does in terms of what they do and vice versa. The idea there would be to hopefully help social cognition kind of realize what its potential is or what its should, potential could be, but seems to be sort of offset because the people who want to do stuff in the real world don't really think and focus on the cognitive stuff and the people who focus on the cognitive stuff don't seem to care as much about the real world. So that's a, that's a generalization. Obviously, there are people who do fall outside of those categories, but I want to make more people see themselves as social cognition researchers and help to realize the promise of social cognition. So that means it's going to be easier to get into your journal now? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> it's going to be harder. Everyone's social gonna cognition. Be, yeah, everybody's social cognition. But I think the harder part is if you're not social cognition in terms of, you know, your knowledge of sort of theories and perspectives and backgrounds, you're going to have to do some work to use that frame to help to understand the study that you do. Um, and the studies that you do, it may mean um, creating uh, more measures and mechanisms that get at things like mental representation or accessibility and their, you know, meter mediating role in the kinds of outcomes that you're interested in. There are a lot of different ways that you can do it, but it's going to mean being able to get a little bit more familiar with some of the social cog literature. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be easier, but there's going to be more opportunity for that, I would say. And hopefully I'd be able to kind of encourage people to actually take those steps. So whether you have to look in that literature yourself or if you're trying to find collaborators who can help you to do that, then um, that's, that's sort of how I hope it would get done. Um, you know, kind of going back to the analogy that I've used in the past is when I was talking about this kind of specialization, you can think about like a sports team, you know, think of a basketball team and you have some individuals on that team who are really good at passing and some individuals who are good at shooting from a distance and some who are really good at blocking. So all those things, not everybody has those skills, but we value all of those skills because they help the team move forward together. And I kind of think about social 
cognition people, the focus on the process and mechanism as being, again, point guards or one part of the team, people who are working on application as being the other part of the team. And if we work together, we can make a lot more progress. But I also think it's beneficial that in order to make that happen, because we're also dealing with some, again, devaluing and undervaluing of the, each other's perspectives, we're going to have to start to appreciate what each other does and the, the contributions that it could make to the things that we most, um, we most care about. Well, good luck with that. It's yeah. a big, the big ask, but I wish you, I wish you some, luck in that. We got some things, got some things going that we can that's great, that's great. help with that. Um, I'm going to transition a little into some of your DEI mentoring experience. And I have another quote from your longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Sam Summers, who I actually learned at breakfast this morning. This, you don't know this yet, but I learned a new thing about you this morning. <laughs> and that when he interviewed for his faculty position, the fact that he played softball, was actually a big selling point for you. Can you tell me about the softball connection first before we get into your mentoring? We have a, a limited do amount we, of time. Do we have a little time? Um, okay, so it did not, <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Find common practices if you wanna get a faculty job is really yes. what this is. Well, this uh, is the case. So uh, we obviously it was not the deciding factor. <laughs> um, for any of you who know Sam and know Sam Summers, he was a get, he was an absolute snatch, a catch <laughs> for us. And um, I think the real element of it, what I think I saw in Sam was, uh, it's, it's funny. There's some work that Sam had done um, he does a lot of work in looking at jury decision making and the ways that race can, um, you know, the awareness or salience of race can affect that process. And um, when I was in graduate school, I remember having a thought of a study and it was a study that was, um, what can people do? Like, you know, when juries tell you like, oh, you know what, you just heard that, but please um, disregard what you just heard or a judge will say that, disregard the evidence that you just heard. I always wonder like, can people do that? Like, can they really disregard it? I mean, it's up there. How are they gonna disregard it? And I remember thinking, I gotta do this study, I gotta do this study. And then I get a candidate, and this candidate is fantastic. It's like, oh, this guy, he went to Michigan, which is great. He does this work on jury decision-making stuff, which is great. Um, he actually went to a small college. He's um, done a lot of teaching at Michigan as well, and Tufts is a sort of a teaching institution or kind of a research and teaching institution. So he's got a profile that sort of looks good for the kinds of people that we want at Tufts. And as I'm reading through these materials, I see he did that study. He did the study to see to what extent can people disregard evidence once they've been prevented, presented with it. And I just couldn't believe it. I was sort of like, oh my God, this guy did that study. So that was probably more, but in addition, yes, he played softball. And, <laughs> and the, you have an award-winning yes, softball we have team. A, well, yeah, we, so the, the psychology department is part of a league that's um, all around across Tufts that has a um, number of teams across academic and administrative departments that play over the summer. So yeah, recruiting him for the softball team, it wasn't a bad idea, but there was a whole lot of other things that went into how I'm getting that job. Okay, okay yeah. good. Holistic hiring approaches, yes, yes. Uh, well, here's what uh, Sam had to say about you to transition into your mentoring. Uh, when thinking about Keith, you have to consider the impact he has in the field, not just through his science, but also as a mentor and role model. In a span of just 48 hours last spring, three people told me specifically that they traced their entry into the field because of Keith. First, a grad student from another university mentioned having heard him give a visiting presentation in their class early in their college career and how it opened their eyes to the type of work one could do as a psychologist studying issues related to identity, race, and intergroup relations. Then an honors thesis student at her defense, which Keith wasn't even a part of her committee, thanked him for just showing her as a first year student that being a scientific researcher was an option for black students like her. And then the next day, our speaker in the anti-racism colloquium series attributed her own entry into the field to being inspired and influenced by Keith's scientific work from afar. All of that in 48 hours, all just the tip of an iceberg that we know runs much deeper than that. It's pretty incredible. That was um, really nice. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, so, yeah, you can clap. Everyone clap. But so how do you, how are you so nice and wonderful? Like, how do you, how do you... How do you do it? How are you like, you're so kind to everyone, you're so inclusive, right? I mean, this is, you don't hear this about every social psychologist, yeah. right? And so, how do, how do we be like you? Oh, uh, that's, that's, that's tough. Um, a lot it is of, tough. No one of, can be like Keith, that's A right. lot of years, a lot of years of, uh, of, of okay, I'm rambling. Um, I think it's, honestly, it's, again, my personality is a little bit more, I'm kind of an extrovert. I do need to recharge from time to time, but in general, I just like people. I like being around people. Um, chatting with people. A lot of times it's not even chatting about research. I just like to get to know people as they are. Um, ultimately, research can come up from time to time, but that's not where most of my connections are. So I feel like I just, I enjoy getting and connecting people and spending time with folks. 
And I think it's, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword, I have to admit, when it comes to thinking about sort of mentorship, because that level of closeness and familiarity that you can get with people, you know, you have to kind of remember that, you know, there's status differentials, and so I still make these mistakes where I think, like, you know, I'm talking to a graduate student, and I goof around with them because I think we're cool, but now we're in a context where the status differential is a little bit more salient for them than it is for me, and I say something to them that's probably injurious, and that's actually just happened yesterday, so apologies to the person, if you are in the room, to whom I did that with, but it was because, you know, we're kind of friendly because it's Keith, and at sometimes it's not Keith, it's Professor Maddox, and I have to remember that that happens. So, Again, double-edged sword, but in general, I think that that general sort of, again, I do, I am generally concerned about sort of what people want to get. I, again, want to see to what extent those things are consistent with uh, the kinds of incentive structures that are out there and maybe give people some feedback as to whether or not some of the things they could be doing could be more or less consistent with that. But also sometimes feedback that some of those systems need to change and that sometimes you have to do what you're going to do. So you can't always be responsive to just how things are. Uh, but yeah, in terms of mentoring, like I said, it's just a lot of it also is just, you know, again, like a little sacrifice. Like sometimes, particularly with graduate students, you just have to take a little bit of a hit and decide that things aren't necessarily going to go the way you want in order to help to make this person's career be what they want it to be. Um, but again, the more you can align those things together, then the less you have to feel like you're sacrificing in some way. So um, yeah, so I do appreciate it. And I also appreciate that, again, some incentive structures are changing so that I'm encouraged to do things like that and that people can recognize that and see that as a part of you know the kinds of things that we're going to be merit meritorious of professional development to help me get promoted so yeah it's a little bit challenging but um again i just like people i want to see them happy i want to see them do well i also my other fatal flaw is that i like people to like me so i think <laughs> sometimes that is challenging because you know it's hard to get in somebody's face and tell them things that they don't want to hear when you're just worried about whether they like you or not so that has to be overcome from time to time. Um, I'm not sure I'm always good at it, but I try. I mean, the other way I sort of interpreted Sam's quote was, you've always been visible in the field, right? So these were a lot of people who you didn't even necessarily have direct interactions with, right? You weren't even directly mentoring about your existence, right? Being in the field, because there are still not that many, right, at your level in social psychology, right? right? right. Um, so I think it's also just being at conferences, giving talks, visiting universities, right? And, having that one exposure like you had with Claude yep. Steele, that's all that it needs for some students. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so kind of related to that, you've managed your departments, DEI committee, um, and you're now helping to spearhead a new interdisciplinary master's program at Tufts. And so for everyone out here who I think we're seeing this big increase in DEI practices in academia and outside of academia, what are some tips you sort of have for people and thinking about which DI practices to jump into based on different stages of your career, um, maybe best or worst practices when DEI stuff has gone wrong. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so funny. So, so the DEI committee, that is something I did at Tufts. So I was part of the first committee in our psychology department. But then, so yeah, you mentioned that I'm the co-director of this master's program. And I think the, so this is much more of an administrative job for me um, in the sense that, you know, now I'm doing like things like figuring out curriculum, doing graduate admissions, you know, the kinds of things that department chairs and their teams usually work on. So um, there's not a lot of content-based work in terms of what I do, other than sort of like figuring out what are the knowledge competencies we need to teach with the curriculum and who's gonna teach those courses, things like that. But um, I think a lot of the things that I've kind of learned really have to do with some of the work that Sam and I actually do when we do go and give talks um, in different organizations. So one of the things that has been really useful for me is kind of thinking about the perspective of like, you know, again, to like know your audience, right? And I think what's been useful to me to maybe even bring it back to the, the research perspective is that, you know, there are other perspectives in psychology that, and research areas that don't necessarily look like stereotyping and prejudice, but have a lot of relationship to it. And one of them is sort of attitudes and persuasion and thinking about how, you know, confronting people about bias, trying to convince them that, you know, that equity is an important um, goal and that we need to do that. Those are all persuasive appeals, right? And there's a whole literature that we have in attitudes that sort of tries to understand the basis and the foundation of people's attitudes, the methods that we might use to help to change those attitudes. And, you know, just like taking the general framework of like, you know, you have a messenger, you have a message and you have an audience and trying to use that, those pieces of information to kind of craft the message um, or think about the member who the messenger and crafting yourself or, you know, using the tools that you have to your disposal to try to get at that audience. And I think that it's important to recognize that, you know, every audience has some sticking point, right? There's something, um, whether it's cognitive, something they know, it might be motivational, an experience or a feeling that they have that's a foundation for why they feel the way they feel, why they think the way they think. 
And I think if you can try to think about what that might be for that audience and then try to target that with your persuasive appeal, you're gonna have a lot more opportunity to try to change their mind around these kinds of practices. So, um, so Sam and I, when we go out and do these presentations, um, I, we don't necessarily frame it this way, but I think about this in a lot of ways that, um, you know, we are the messengers. There's an audience and there's a message that we have. A lot of times that audience isn't necessarily down. They're not ready to hear, hear the message that we have. And oftentimes we're really just doing some introductory stuff, just trying to let people know what implicit bias is. And we do this in a way that tries to let them know that, you know, bias is something that's going to happen, it's going to take place, not to absolve you of any guilt, but to give you some understanding that there are other situational factors and structural factors that are contributing to that bias and that you have power in terms of helping to change that either the expression or the impact of those biases by changing the context, changing the situation, changing your processes. So we're trying to like just get people to kind of be down with that story. And the idea is that we often get audiences that don't want to hear that from us. Um, sometimes they don't want to hear it from me because I'm a person of color and I'm just motivated to try to do things that are going to benefit me and people who look like me. So they may not want to hear that from me, but then Sam is there and he doesn't look like me, but he's given the same message. So. For them, Sam is probably a pretty effective communicator. For some people in the audience, when Sam says something, they don't want to hear it from him because they're thinking like, he's not a person who has lived the kind of experience that I have. Why would I be listening to this person try to tell me about things that they should do in this organization? People in this organization don't even listen to me as a person of color, and now they have to bring in this outside person to tell us what to do, right? There's a lot of resentment that can go on in that. But then maybe I'm there to be able to help to allay some of the concerns that those folks might have about Sam as a communicator. So it's this idea that like different people in the audience might have different kinds of perspectives and the way we, we just like working together to be perfectly honest, but the I way in which we- car trips are really fun Car actually. trips, yeah, okay. So <laughs> the way that, um, you know, that we've kind of structured our interaction, I framed it as like, it helps to get to a broader audience that's out there, right? There are more people out there, some people who are there to hear me, some people who are there to hear Sam, so to speak, but we're just more able to, re sorry, we use this strategy to be able to reach more people. So, um, so that's one of the things I know, just know your audience, try to understand like what's the foundation, what's the sticking point in terms of their attitudes, what are their incentive structures, and to what extent can you align your message in order to get closer to the kinds of things that they're going to want to do themselves. And so what if you are a person who wants to do these things, but you don't have a Sam you to go with you? I mean, because I think there are a lot of people, yeah. right, who want to ignite change, but they don't necessarily have a tag team duo that can do yep. what you're saying, right? So if, if there's someone in that environment, do you have any tips for them? Yeah, I think, well, honestly, I think it would be being in that environment, but really trying to cultivate allies, right? So again, I'm not sure that we're still using the term ally, but the general idea is that you need some folks who are not necessarily um, perceived as having a vested interest in this particular outcome in order to help to sort of share that message. I had this uh, sort of a hands across America analogy that, um, that I use that a lot of times when, you know, you want to communicate with somebody and like, let's say, sorry for the stereotype, but let's say I'm trying to communicate with somebody in a conservative state in the Midwest someplace, but I live in a liberal state in the East. And the message that I send to them directly is going to look so weird and so different that they're just going to like completely, you know, push it aside. But if I can communicate to somebody who's next to me and give them a message, them a message that's closer to how they think, and if they communicate to the person next to them and then next to them, then that message is going to change in a way that's going to be more palatable by the time it gets to the person in the Midwest. So you just have to kind of develop allies that are it's more closely aligned to the audiences that you want to get to, and they're going to be able to think about ways of framing messages that you may not necessarily think about, or they may have elements of their identity that might not lead to the same kind of, you know, backlash that, that, that your identity would. So again, I do think it's really about cultivating sort of allies and again, people who can get you closer to the audience that you actually want to reach because they can use analogies, they can use metaphors, what have you, that are going to resonate with those people more. And a lot of times those are the kinds of things that really help us to change our thinking. Yeah. And there's strength in numbers, right? And so trying yeah. to get other people with this persuasive tactics, I guess. Yeah. Um, so relatedly, can you tell me a little more about where your other Tufts colleague, Dr. Heather Uri, told me that you started something called the Keith Lists? <laughs> and I don't know what this is, because this was not when I was at Tufts, so you started things without me? Sorry, um. I, was, I apologize for these reactions. Um, <laughs> So Keith's List is a, um, it's a term that came out of uh, the sort of like organizational structure that I had for our, um, our diversity committee in the psych department. So um, it came from the idea that this is a committee that's doing work that is trying to make itself obsolete. Like we wanna make sure we're doing this work now, but we want this work to be able to be done in the normal structure of the universe, or sorry, of the department 
um, sort of, uh, you know, administrative sort of work. So all the committees should be doing some elements of the kinds of things we do. And that in order to do that, what we wanted to do is sort of think about the work in the committee as being, you know, something that was able to be picked up. Like when this committee stops and somebody else comes in, or if we need to give this to somebody else, that there's an opportunity for someone to sort of like see where we left off and then be able to pick up the ball from there. And so Keith's lists are, they made fun of the form that I created, which I think was a project overview form or something like that, some kind of title that basically said, here are the people who are working on the project. Here's the title of the project. Here's the goal of the project here. And, you know, lots of different things like, um, you know, are there people in the department that you need to talk to in order to get information data about this? People that are the people who are going to actually be the ones who affect the change, right? So is there a chair of a committee that is going to have some say over whether or not this thing is implemented? Um, what is the research that you're using, you know, in terms of helping to inform these kinds of policies? Are there any surveys or anything like that? So it was just one basically Google sheet that had a bunch of different questions and opportunities to kind of put information in so that when one person left that committee and came in, another person came in, they could go and look at all of the information that somebody had worked on. And so it's just basically like a way of tracking people's history um, so that we'd have some institutional memory because, yeah, we've all been in the situation where you walk into something and you know a lot of things have been done, but you have no idea where they did. And it's you got to basically start over again. So it's just an opportunity to make sure that people didn't have to feel like they were starting all over again when they came in. Probably the a good paper trail, too. Right. So, right. you know, those of you who want to do DEI stuff, right, oftentimes you need data points, you need the historical lineage of like how often have we had programs like this or how few students have we admitted from X backgrounds. Right. So it's it's a good paper trail. Yeah. Too, yeah. I, would I think the Keats list part, though, because, again, I think one of it is that, you know, like there's it, a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work to kind of like track those kinds of things. And while people often see the benefit of that kind of work, then doing it and sticking with it is another thing altogether. So I think they maybe gave it a funny name just to kind of like keys lists. Yes, it's keys lists. lists. That's true. It is true. Okay, well, I'll work on that pronunciation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess to build a little more on this um, DEI practice, I mean, being one of only in a department is something that I get asked uh, by a lot of students, a lot of early trainees in their career, and there's not a ton of black faculty in your department, right? right? Ton? Yeah. yeah. Are there a ton? No. Yeah, no? me and one other person. Yeah, yeah. So can you, I guess... Oh, sorry, now two. Yeah, can you sort of elucidate, I guess, a little more on what your experience being one of only in a department, being one of only even in a field of social psychology, right? Although now we are seeing a lot more diversity, which is amazing to see, but what has that been like for you? And how has that shaped how you sort of approach not only mentoring and working with your students, but also the research that you maybe want to see in social cognition and otherwise? Yeah, I think, yeah. So again, being sort of one of only, it's a little weird. I think I was I was bred for this. Bred's the wrong word. I was trained for this in a sense because I was one of only growing up. So I was born in Detroit, but I grew up in a suburb of Detroit called Troy, which was very white for the most part. So I was of few number then. And so I've kind of had those experiences growing up to the point where the transition to college was maybe a little less challenging for me given that I had been experienced like being by myself in a lot of these kinds of contexts. And in college, it was actually different because then there were a lot more black people. And honestly, I still have some struggles with that. Like, oh, wow, there's black people around, right? It's just, it's different than how I grew up. And it's something that, you know, requires some adjustment. But the idea is that it's all good, but the going through those kinds of experiences maybe um, had two different effects. One, I definitely experienced bias and prejudice and discrimination. Um, a lot of things and maybe some of the ways in which I am in terms of interpersonally are ways that I've developed over time to kind of to maybe deflect those things, which is, you know, unfortunate to the extent to which people have to change themselves. Um, I'm not sure it was an active thing. I think it's a little more consistent with like how I naturally would have developed grew over time. But I think I'm a likable person in general. And I think that maybe staves off some of the kinds of negative discrimination that I might experience over time. And again, that's not a strategy that everybody else necessarily should or, or has available to them. Um, but I think it has kind of, you know, steeled me to be in, in those kinds of environments. But, you know, when I became a faculty member and then again, you have these sort of conversations where you start to think about, you know, changing policies or structures in your organization and in your department. And it is hard to be the only person that looks like me to kind of get up and say these kinds of things. But I didn't have that situation, I have to admit. So because I have a great colleague in Sam Summers, who's a great person, who's an advocate, loves to mix it up with people from time to time. We're very different in that way. I'm a little bit less confrontational. But Sam would say some of the things that needed to be said in those meetings. And I didn't have to be the one that would say it to be marginalized. And I could agree with it. And I could sometimes say things on my own, but I always had Sam there to be able to say these things. So I hate to say it, but you got to fall back on you just trying to develop and cultivate allies 
can be a really important way of surviving that. But if you want to go and say you don't have that opportunity, um, then I think what you have to do is to remember that self-care is important. Try to figure out how you can find a community of other people who might be experiencing what you're experiencing. Um, be able to talk to them. And sometimes it's, you know, basically just getting out what you need to say out of like alleviating frustration. Sometimes in those processes, you get information and strategies that other people have developed that you might use yourself. But I think over time, you just need to try to work on making sure that you're okay. But then you can do that by trying to create opportunities to connect with other people who are in similar situations. And I think that then you can start to affect a little bit more change, like you said, with you know, strength in numbers. So the more people that are around you that are interested in seeing the same kinds of things that you're interested in seeing, the less burden that any one person is gonna take when you, know, you have to try to go up against what the, you know, the adversarial system would be. Mm -hmm. And easier to do as faculty than as a grad student, I would yeah. imagine. No, too. absolutely so. And I think yeah. right now we're seeing this division in graduate school training programs, right, at all different levels where they don't look like the faculty in their departments, right? And so we see this division. And I guess, do you have any insight from your practice on these very, the SPSP diversity committee or otherwise on sort of what you do in those types of contexts? Maybe you're the only faculty, but your graduate students look completely different or think differently mm -hmm. than the rest of the faculty. Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, again, my, my experience has been at Tufts, and I have to admit, like, again, because we've probably built, um, you know, an organization where we have a number of people who are critical mass, um, you know, kind of created some critical mass around our interest in equity and our interest in change, that um, when we hear things from graduate students, we're more likely to listen. And, you know, we still sometimes grumble because we, you know, there's these things like, oh, I was trained with this, and why are they complaining about this? And we can understand that things can change over time, that we're not always just doing things the way we always did them is always the right thing to do. So while we even struggle with that sometimes, we do listen. So we started to survey grad students on a regular basis, um, take into account those surveys, meet with the faculty, and talk about ways in which we might implement some change. Um, and that has actually been much more likely to happen in recent years because we've been a little bit more successful in building the diversity of our graduate student program. So our program is more diverse than it ever has been before. And, you know, again, with that comes the challenges of bringing people into a system that's not necessarily built for them, but we're working to try to make that change. Um, it would be irresponsible to bring people into an organization without thinking about the ways in which you could change it structurally and procedurally for them to succeed. So, so we're, we've been down with trying to create that, that change in terms of the, the actual structure to help to facilitate and uh, help the grad students achieve the goals that they're interested in. And I think that's what a lot of people are missing right now, is they're all focused on recruitment, but then they don't focus on retention, yeah. right? What are the things we need to do to make people happy, keep people happy, make them feel safe? Um, and that's where I think a lot of us are doing the incorrect choice right now. Yeah. Um, and actually, some of that work is getting done for us because um, our graduate students recently unionized, and that unionization has led to um, a much higher salary or stipend, I should say, associated with being a research assistant or a teaching assistant. And that's going to help a lot, right? So, And that's stuff that the faculty can be supportive of but wasn't really directly involved in. But again, those are the kinds of things that, you know, it's not just one source, but everybody has to work on um, trying to affect these kinds of structural changes. Yeah, I don't know many programs that survey their grad students that often. So I think Tufts is probably a magical bubble, but, yeah. you know, maybe other programs will hear this and start surveying their <laughs> students. Um, I think we're going to try and have a little bit of time for Q&A um, just from everyone there. Um, so my kind of final big picture question for you is the well wishes for the field. You've talked a lot today about your own history how you sort of see diversity practices, where you want to see research going, um, your emphasis on mentoring students, even if that detracts from your ability to publish at times. So yeah. in your ideal future social psychology world, where do you where do you want us to go? What do you want to see? You knew this question was coming. I knew, but no, the way you framed it actually is a little different than what I was expecting. But I think uh, you know, honestly, to kind of go back to, you know, just like the work that I'm doing at the journal, this is where I have the most, you know, opportunity for impact. Um, that idea of trying to, to heal that divide. And I think the divide is in social psych in general, but in social cognition, it's in a place where I feel like I can have a little bit more impact. But this, um, you know, the kind of backlash that we're seeing towards, you know, efforts to sort of increase equity and efforts towards anti-racism and anti-colonialism. And that backlash is, again, understandable. And I think my hope maybe is um, that we try to use the psychology that we study to try to understand that issue and understand that problem and come up with ways to deal with it. So, you know, one part is just, again, we can get mad at people for exhibiting the kind of backlash and getting angry at the sort of the perceived lack of um, opportunity that they get, right, this relative deprivation that they might be feeling. And it 
may be the case that that relative deprivation, you know, if you're somebody who's got privilege and you're losing just a little bit, it's going to feel like a lot to them. And I don't want to necessarily, you know, sympathize too hard with that perspective, but it's human, right? And if you have, a human is having a response like that, we know how to help them deal with it. So if we want to make progress, we might have to do things that are going to potentially mean that we're catering a bit to the concerns of the people that we're trying to convince, mm -hmm. even those people who we don't necessarily believe that we should have to do this. But I think sometimes that can be the most effective way forward. If you want to come up with sustainable solutions, then what is right isn't necessarily what's going to be effective. So I don't think everybody out there needs to be the person that's trying to understand the concerns of people opposed to anti-racism and assuage those, or assuage those fears or concerns in order to move forward. But I think if some people are working on that, then we can limit the amount of threat that those folks are feeling. We can put them in a place where they're able to come to the table to hear some difficult things that they're going to need to deal with. You know, coming to the table is one thing. You can still be threatened when you're at the table, but you got to get them there in the first place. So I feel like if we can do more to bring people together, get them at the table, prepare them for the kinds of threats that they're going to experience and feel. And again, not everybody needs to be part of this. I don't think marginalized people necessarily have to take on this role, but it can be effective. If it's going to be used, then we figure out ways to get that done. So I just want people to kind of like overcome this particular divide. And I think, again, in the journal, we're going to try to do some of these things in terms of thinking about trying to connect the core values that we all have. We're all scientists, right? We're all interested in trying to develop ideas and theories and hypotheses and using empirical approaches to try to enlighten those things so we can come up with a better understanding of people. And if we can just kind of get people to rally around those core ideals, then I think that's a nice starting point to bring people together to the table and then ultimately make some decisions about how to move forward in ways that are you know, more sustainable. Well, I hope you can lead those efforts because that sounds like a big call. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think we, we are seeing this increased division, right, of what can be published in what journals, right? So I'm excited for you to be at a journal like Social Cognition, which historically hasn't been a journal for diversity-related research, right? I think it's the changes in leadership that we're sort of seeing across the field right now that is giving new opportunities to everyone across social psychology, right, to sort of think differently, right, which is what I've always loved about you is you always get everyone to think differently, right? Every conversation, I'm like, huh. Why do Keith say that? And it makes me question things, right? It's a really um, nice way of putting that. But like, it's, you know, sometimes it's confusing, but most of the time it gets me to think flexibly, right? And that's what we need to do, right? This bipartisan conflict, right, that we sort of talk about is if we can just figure out more flexible ways to communicate across these lines, we should be able to find a more equitable way, right, for all of us to be able to coexist. Um, so I want to thank you so much for your time today. So we thank Dr. Maddox. Thank you. This is not the norm for out of the lab, but we do have a little bit of time for questions because we'd like to be norm breakers up here on this stage. Um, it looks like Sam Summers has a question. So you gotta use I the guess microphone. he's taking first Everybody's got to use the microphone. Those of you who don't know Sam Summers now, you can see him walking up to the microphone. Uh, so we have just about 10 minutes or so for questions. But yes, please stand in line at the microphone so everyone can hear you. Buckle up, everybody. OK. Um, I've, waited. I've never gotten to say this before to Cox. I'm very excited. Um, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. <laughs> no. uh, and I just wanted to say there are a lot of ways to measure an individual's impact in the field and in uh, the world in which we live. You know, there's a number of publications and there's uh, grant monies brought in and there's awards won and there's H index and all those kinds of things. Um, but there's also like the impact that one can have as like a human being, as a holistic uh, gestalt human being on the field. Uh, and I think you heard a little bit about that today. I, I did make up Keith list. I'm sorry. It was a little <laughs> sorry, but but we could call it K index. Like it would work. Like, <laughs> like in all sincerity, I don't think there's anyone in here who has that kind of index. Just in terms of again, Sarah read like a very short segment of like just over a period of two days, the number of people who expressed to us that they somehow were brought into the field because because of the work that you do, Keith. So um, I don't really have a question. Um, I, 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 it's more of a comment. Um, I, I, I just, I just want to say I love you, buddy, and I'm really proud to be your colleague. Um, but mostly, what I wanted to say is, I just don't think that um, anyone else that I know in this field has had the kind of impact that you have, just through your sheer force of like humanity and personality and affability and thoughtfulness. You are the most thoughtful person that I think I know in the entire field. And yes, that does mean meetings can go very long sometimes, <laughs> um, but thoughtful in like the best of ways as well. Um, and I just uh, wanted to, to say, I'm so glad that we as a society are recognizing you for that. Um, I think that um, 
few people have the ability that you have to walk into a committee or to a group or to an organization and make it more fun, but also make it better and more thorough and more rigorous. Uh, and you have done that for Social Psych and for SPSP in a way that I don't think we can say about anyone else in this room or at this conference. So thank you and congrats. <laughs> Sorry? I have a Kleenex offer for you. Oh, you I don't need any Kleenex. Oh, I'm just going to let yeah. it flow. There are some people crying in the audience for those of you watching this recorded online later, just so we're all clear. Um. <laughs> Hi, Keen. Hi. <laughs> so I went as, before I ask my question, I just want to say that so when Keith was talking about how UCLA and, U, and UCSB had a partnership, like I was part of their partnership, and I got to say I'm just super, super, super grateful that you have been part of my academic journey from day one, and it's been super fun, and I love that we still hang out and, you know, have fun to all hours of the night sometimes at SASP and things like that, and so that's been really fun. So thank you for being both a, a, a wonderful, um, I think, standard bearer for our field, but also just a, a really cool friend and, and colleague. So i start with that, but then I actually have a question. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so my question is, I was at the, I was wandering through the exhibit hall and one of the booths had a little survey that you can you know, respond to with stickers and it was quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods. And the mixed methods panel had the vast majority of stickers. And so my question is how, if at all, do you see mixed methods playing a role in social cognition moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, again, the, the idea of using more qualitative analyses, it gives, some information around some of the surveys, some of the skill, sorry, the, uh, the questionnaires that we might use, right? So a rating on a scale, there's something behind that and qualitative analyses can do that. So I think a lot of times people don't necessarily, they might ask some open-ended questions, but it's not gonna be a focus of some of their analysis, in part because we don't necessarily get trained with some of the sophisticated analyses that you can do with open-ended data. So I think it's be fantastic. And, and to be honest, social cognition, if you read the author instructions, mixed methods is in there, right? Qualitative is in there. It's just most of the time is not gonna be just qualitative. So I think you're right. It's gotta be a little bit of a mixture. And you know, this maybe goes along with the, you know, what I was saying before that in some ways, if you want to convince a social cognition person of something, like you got to have a little cognition in there, but you can also like bring in some qualitative stuff and then they start to see that these things are interrelated with one another and then they start to see the benefit and the merit and then that's another opportunity for them to think about what they're going to do the next time they do a study. So yeah, I feel like it's got to be a marriage. You can't just do one thing and expect people to go there. They've got to see a little bit of what they need to see in what they're already doing. Yeah, thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This was really great. I mean, we learned so much, you know, about you and your work in Tufts that we can't read in papers necessarily. Um, but one thing I was really particularly interested in was your talk about DEI and your efforts at that, but also with in individual graduate students, right? Um, and we know there's a lot of systemic issues in academia that impact everybody within academia, undergrads to professors. And I was just wondering if you could speak more to concrete ways that we can change like, for example, especially graduate students, right? We have um, a lot of us are coming in with debt and a lot of us are leaving with debt. Um, you know, mental health is really a concern with graduate students. And so I'm just, if you could speak to more of the systemic issues and how we can try to, and I, I would love to hear more about what Tufts is doing um, on that level with graduate students and how you would suggest other institutions to really put that into action as well with grad students and also undergrads, of course. But um, as, a, as a grad student, it'd be great to hear more about that and how you guys have been doing that. Yeah, I think, well, you know, again, a little bit at a time, I, I would basically say, but one thing around the mental health, a little bit is just, I think, you know, again, sort of historically, there's some stigma that's sort of associated with mental health that people have been dealing with. But I think, to be honest, the pandemic, you know, if you want to say that there was a silver lining, it did help us to see some things that were problematic in our society. So it was kind of a stress test. And that stress test led us to be a little bit more appreciative of, you know, things that are happening behind the camera, you know, that the kids or students aren't necessarily going to be able to show or to tell you and that we don't necessarily have to know what that is we just know know that it's there it's happening and so maybe being a little bit more relaxed and understanding that there are things that are going on in somebody's life and that could mean being a little more relaxed around deadlines standards like that but you also have to remember that that 
in the broader society, some of these things are happening, but they're also not. So I know that there's some challenges where you want to be lax and sort of supportive for graduate students, but if they have goals and those goals are, you know, still a part of some of the broader incentive structures that are out there, then there's got to be some time for some tough love too. So there's got to be some opportunity for recognizing some of the challenges people, folks are facing, but then also realize that there may be some incentives that are out there that they're going to have to respond to and that we got to figure out ways to help you to get to that goal. And sometimes that doesn't look like support, but it's, it's, you know, a little more like tough love. Um, I think, you know, again, decreasing the stigma around mental illness was one thing, sharing a little bit more information about access to those kinds of opportunities for students, um, you know, having like relaxed leave policies if students need to take an extended leave. Um, and that's just a part of it. The, the money part would be graduate student union is done a lot of work to try to make sure that some of these opportunities are there and that they're making more money. Um, so again, that's a tough kind of thing, but um, you know, again, that's the union, right? And so there are other agents that are sort of operating and creating change or helping to create the kind of change that's going to be more supportive for grad students. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Don't be afraid, Keith. Um, Not afraid. <laughs> so many questions I could ask you, but um, here's a question for you. You know, I talked a lot last fall and the previous fall uh, about making changes and moves, and I'm a big advocate for all of us taking on leadership roles, every one of you. Um, so, so maybe some advice to people about making those leaps, becoming an editor, becoming a program director. Yeah. Um, how did you come to decide to do those things? And um, and the part that it's, it's hard to make those leaps sometimes. So how do you overcome your own concerns or, uh, you know, about that? I, uh, sorry, I, I, it's a great question. I'm not laughing at the question, but I had an experience. Um, so when I was a junior faculty member, I was feeling slammed with a lot of work. And I got asked to be on an NSF panel. So this will be the panel where you kind of like review the proposals that come in. You get a subset of those proposals. You have to be the primary sort of like presenter on those proposals, talk about their merits and weaknesses. And then we're making decisions about grants. And it was going to be take three days away from, you know, work, go to DC, sit in a room with a bunch of other faculty members. And you were going to have to read something along the lines of like being primary on like four or five proposals, but you'd have to read something upwards of like 15 or 16. And I just thought about like, no, I don't have time for that. That's just so much work. It's ridiculous to think about me doing that in the context of what I'm doing now. And I had a colleague, Sal Sirachi, who passed away. Um, but Sal, when I mentioned this to him, he said, you're out of your mind. And he said, think about like how great that's going to be. That experience is going to be fantastic. Like, yes, you will take a hit, but you're going to learn so much about what happens in that room. You're going to be able to talk to other colleagues and hear their perspectives on the kinds of work and the things that they want to prioritize and research that's getting funded. Like, there's going to be so much information from that experience. Like, it's something you can't walk away from. So I ended up doing it, which was great. And it was Sal that sort of like made me feel like I could overcome some of the challenges that I might have felt. Like, there was some insecurity part there, too. Am I really supposed to be in this room, et cetera? But Sal helped me to overcome that. And now I think about that every time another opportunity is presented. Uh, Cammy, the problem is that I think I say yes too much. Got too many things on the plate. I have this, uh, I would show it to you, but I didn't prepare it. But I have an email signature. <laughs> so Sarah sort of alluded to this. I have an email signature. And you know how like, a signature will have your, your affiliation, um, you know, your role, blah, blah, blah. Well, I made one that has all my affiliations, like all the different things that I was doing at any particular time. And it's this long on a computer screen. It's just absurd. So I said yes to a lot of things, but I think the other part that, um, that in terms of helping to make a decision about what to do is if you can figure out a way that you think it's going to help you to achieve a goal that you have. So, you know, part of the reason that I am um, on the diversity kidding for APS is in part because I think APS is, again, a broader society that's going to be able to have a little bit more impact in terms of more psychologists, more scientists or psychologists outside of just social psychology. So I think there are things that we can do and help to affect change there. Um, I also am on an internationalization committee, and I couldn't even tell you the acronym. There are a number of different things, but it's basically the U.S. Um, National uh, Committee on Psychology, and it's about internationalization of psychology. And I'm on that committee, and there's a little work that's associated, but really the association is helping me to think a little bit more about trying to broaden the range of the potential authors and editors and edit associate editors and reviewers for the kinds of papers that we get. And so it's coming up, and we worked on coming up with a tip sheet to try to help people to think about incentivizing um, your publisher, right, so the journal publisher, but then also at the level of the editors and the reviewers about the kinds of concerns and constraints and considerations that people from different countries are dealing with when they're trying to publish in U.S. journals. So that was something that I thought I want to be a part of that because it's going to help me to do this job as being editor. So yeah, I, I want to do things that I think are integrated and will kind of connect with a goal that I have in general. But yeah, there are a lot of different opportunities there and I probably said yes to way too many of them. 
Great, just that time. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Keith, for everything you have done, everything you will do. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Happy